Intelligence. Hello, Music Multiverse listeners, and welcome to Beyond Your Radio's Unknown Sundays, and happy St. Patrick's Day. This is Unknown Sundays, where we take an artist or band or something, anything in music, that could be relatively unknown to most of the masses. Uh, and might be the ability of some of our listeners and watchers to explore something different or out of their wheelhouse. Please remember that this is an extension of the article section of beyondyourradio.com. So if you want the full detail written there by Clever Old Knee, it's still there. This episode, we explore the singer-songwriter Thea Gilmore. Indie rock, folk rock, alternative, alternative pop, hell, even a little club looping in, in there now. So her 28 years in the business. Have you heard her? If not, you should have. But before we explore why you should have, let's check to make sure you're subscribed. That's if you want to be. I mean, come on. We built a monster, and it's people like you we want to show it off to daily. If you have already subscribed, thank you, old soul. You truly get us. Now, let's explore the catalog, career, and why Thea Gilmore is someone you should have noticed. My favorite Gilmore girl, and no, I'm not talking about that crazy show where the lyric, the dialogue was far beyond the uh, standard palette of dialogue that would happen between mother and daughter and siblings and other people, although clever show, so to speak. No, I'm talking about Thea Gilmore, British Neil Youngish singer-songwriter that's been in the business of, oh man, nearly 30 years now? Kind of has that wonderful, catchy folk rocker kind of feel. Uh, not that she can't diverse into all kinds of things as we'll get on with this conversation. Thea Gilmore on Unknown Sundays 2024 might just be the one of my favorite female artists from across the pond. It is the singing, songwriter, cleverness, punchy, jabby lyrics, the way she weaves in and out of genres of rock and folk and alternative and punky pop. What is it that ability to make a song her own when she's bending Bob Dylan or Neil Young or the Gin Blossoms or even the Buggles, if you know that song? What I think it is truly is the fact that her voice carries a sincerity in that delivery. It hangs beautifully when it needs to, it falls when required, and it finds connection in just about every tone and tune, no matter the genre. She can slip from playful to memorable, from lighthearted to somber and dark, and uh, without losing any hint or flow within the recording itself. I feel she's an artist in the music multiverse because she loves it, because she was meant to be. Um, she loves what she does. Making music is what she wants. And leaving the impression she chooses through the stories and experiences that she shares and retells. That's success, if you ask me. My introduction to Thea Gilmore did not begin in a used record bin. I know you're shocked. Uh, this one I owe to NPR. And in the article on our Beyond Your Radio, I do have a link to that um, NPR radio program. Um, it was brought to me by one of my uh, co-workers back in the restaurant equipment and supplies days. He came to me and said, do you know anything about this Thea Gilmore and this, this album Avalanche? Have you heard of her? And I had not. And that intrigued me right away as he was not the kind of individual to fall in love with new music uh, in that regard. So whatever NPR was throwing down that day about her uh, sold him and sold me without even listening to the radio program. As a matter of fact, to this day, I still haven't listened to it. Shocker. <laughs> I went on the recommendation and description from my friend and went into record theater in Buffalo, who always had a, a knack for being up on it, you know, realizing what was happening, whether it was across the pond or in our backyard, some up and comers. So I got it without hesitation. Um, I definitely would have agreed with the independence comment uh, that she had established herself as the wordsmith of her generation. I still concur with this to this day. After just a couple of listens, I definitely 
definitely uh, was in love with the I, how she delivers the music, um, whether it be sparse in folk or whether it be rocky or punchy. Miss Gilmore did this and then some, and with not much production and trickery in these first albums. Now, that album, Avalanche, was her fourth. Um, in case I didn't mention this, she is from Oxford, England. I keep saying across the pond. I'm sure that everybody would like to know where she's from. Obviously, those in that area know of her probably fairly well. Um, using just her guys, her instrument of choice, which can be the voice, the guitar, piano, and I, I think there's a xylophone in there, um, and the talents of Nigel Stonier, um, which production instrumentalist and her husband up until divorce in 2021, they just nailed down her sound completely and utterly. There's no one like her doing that folk that well and connecting with a small venue club or a bar, connecting on a larger scale where it might seem like it's thematic and soundtracking in to some degree. She, no matter how small or how big the song, it's always in that delivery. And that album, Avalanche, in my estimation, in that year, was one of the best albums of that year. And you had Madonna, Evanescence, Liz Fair, um, Dido was even in there, if you want to talk about uh, performers of nature who had, had uh, tons of skill and, and um, record backgrounds and big money thrown at them. Her latest release, um, I'll get to in a minute, but what I want to talk about is this genre or her style of music. Categorizing that is like the tale of growth and movement toward expansion. Obviously, in the early days, it was stripped down for intensive purposes of probably budget, money, and uh, but she had her youth and a Gregorious pension for alternative lyrics, whether it was sparse stripped down arrangements or they were always well produced, and but they were always hanging on every word and slip of tongue and snappy delivery. Then again, that's that wordsmith at work. Youth comes to maturity, obviously and expansion of her palette and instruments, as well as with songwriting development. For me, it seemed to be a growth in beauty instead of angst, but still not losing that original wordplay that she was so good at, still is to this day. Her topical pursuits, the changing environment around her, and the ways, not so good ways, of the world certainly had their impression and in mindset into all of this. And I'm sure personally, like children and career there were catalysts and vices that were bestowed upon her and everything that she did. Her latest release, self-titled, it's reaching in, it's got loops, it's ambient-like music uh, structures too, uh, still harkens to the artist she remains at this day. If you want to hurt me The self-title obviously is a rebirth and rediscovery, but she doesn't jump off a cliff or off the deep end here. She has an angst, but it's smart. It's hopeful. It's balanced. It's hearkening to a realism instead of harshness. The lyrics, whether delivered in the harmonic speech or Brit punk, call it, spiritual vocal or whispered temperance, the music entrances and succumbs to her melodic signature. Obviously, that means striving the lyrics from her meaning to what you take from it, which I think is another beautiful part of all of this. There's not a solitary record that doesn't mag manufacture this in her entire catalog. I'll even go as far as to say even the Christmas album, uh, Strange Communion, uh, has this delivery and temperance. Even her covering Bob Dylan's uh, John Wesley Harding, it's her signature, it's her hymnal. She also was commissioned, in case you didn't know this, for the final works of Sandy Denny. Now, I did not know Sandy Denny, but I'm grateful to 
Miss Gilmore for introducing this to me because of her commissioning to do this piece of work. She finished the final works. It's people like this that drive the record industry and people like me into the places that are the most interesting. It's why she is on our Unknown Sunday. I certainly would love to have a catalog review show with her as my panelist. <laughs> Big dream, right? That would be awesome because I'd be having the panelists on the show and critiquing the very catalog review show we're in. But what I encourage you to do is to get into her catalog if you do not know. Maybe if you did one album, do another. We're going to be doing Melissa Etheridge this week on Tuesday. And you know what? Miss Gilmore is probably one of those artists that could pretty much hold the same female singer-songwriter rock category with her longevity and catalog. It is extensive. It's extremely interesting on all kinds of sounds and genres that she plays in. And maybe by that time, I'm certainly not expecting her to give this upstate New York idiot, me, music listener, her time, valuable time. But anyway, you might be able to be a panelist with me discussing her catalog and putting it in the order of your favorites. There's going to be a demand for it. I know it because I'm counting on you. That's right. You across the pond, Oxfordians, Chesterians, Westchesterians. I'm counting on you to help us, right? Because this is a catalog that deserves to get past the neglectful single consumptive American uh, musical experiences that most of the people over here have. Are you ready? You should be, as she should have been as popular as Sarah McLaughlin once you hear her. Yeah, you think I oversold that a bit? Nah, I'm sticking to that statement. Want to know why? Let it be known. Because all oh, this will make sense once you hear the albums. I say, let it be known. Thea Gilmore albums in my collection. Burning Dorothy in 1998, which was her first album. The Lipstick Conspiracies in 2000, Rules for Jokers in 2001, Songs from the Gutter in 2002, Avalanche in 2003, which is where I was introduced to her, Loft Music in 2004, which were covers, including Neil Young, Harpo's Ghost in 2006, Lie Jacker in 2008, Recorded Delivery, which is the live performances, that's fantastic, in 2009, Strange Communion, that Christmas album I talked about, also in 2009, Murphy's Heart in 2010, the covers of John uh, of the Bob Dylan, John Wesley Harding in 2011, Don't Stop Singing with Sandy Denny in 2011, and Regardless in 2013. I've had a hard time finding and getting the albums into my collection as of late. She has another release as the band Afterlight uh, in 2021, which is the self-titled which is an interesting poetically delivered album falling in the timeline of the emancipation of uh, Eva Gray, which is a fantastic album showcasing a little bit more vocal and softness in, in her. Um, there are also EPs which bear singles that are familiar, but it has wonderful covers with the additions and B-sides. So be sure to check those out. And of course, check her out on the web and the YouTube. There's plenty out there. We're on the web at beyondyourradio.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, got articles, videos, and podcasts. It's all about albums, artists, and bands, but you know that. Go Beyond Your Radio with us, a real music appreciation channel. Until next week, happy listening.